My talk today, and I'm representing Insight Secure, which I'll explain a bit later what we do. My talk here is about uh, security, and you could summarize that as people or tasks or software systems actually deliberately wanting to break systems and cause errors or steal your data. A um, bit about the agenda, why we're here, talking about embedded, embedded security, what we can offer. Talk a bit about the security threats, a uh, bit background on cryptography, if you will. Um, and then wh what can we do to solve it in embedded systems? Uh, what kind of implementation techniques can we, uh, can we offer? Inside Secure, based in the south of France, uh, is, uh, is a company providing uh, security, embedded security in the form of hardware and software that actually can go into your chip designs or secure elements, basically the little smart cut type of chips that you uh, see uh, in actual smart cards, passports, cell phones. And uh, what we do uh, with, with these systems is uh, provide device authentication or people uh, authentication, enabling mobile commerce, uh, protecting content, uh, the, the, the HD video that you can stream into your devices, and provide secure communications. So let's look a bit about embedded security. What, what is it? It is basically the, this refers to the security features built into a device. Um, and, and, and it is what a device needs to be part of a distributed com computing system, uh, which is typically uh, attached always, always on, available always. And a lot of these embedded devices we need to be able to trust, to trust to do its work, to trust to uh, basically serve for you or for your application what, what it needs to do. Which kind of, what kind of devices do need this embedded security? And I, I would say today, if, if you uh, heard uh, Richard York's uh, talk this morning, every device, basically every device, every device that's connected or even, even temporarily not connected, like, like point of sale, uh, mobile point of sale terminals that not always are connected. So mobile phones, tablets, all kinds of handheld devices uh, would need security. And the interesting thing here is that if you look at the, this bottom line, the servers, the machine to machines, the Internet of Things, that's obviously that you need security there. And in enterprises, people are actually asking for security, requiring it. I need to protect my data using VPNs. Corporate to branch offices need to be able to secure that. In mobile phones, typically in the hands of users, typically they would say, well, I don't need security. Maybe I don't want to pay for security. That even that, that for digit pin to unlock my iPhone is, is bothering me. But it's more like the other parties in the ecosystem that are asking for security. Think about the operators. Uh, they want to basically maintain their uh, revenue stream. Think about content providers. And now in the advent of, let's say, actual e-wallets and payments and maybe medical files going to be stored on the device, now the, the consumers are going to ask for it. So what has happened in, in lately uh, in the news, and, and, and we all, all, all see a lot of, lot of things happening, and, and I guess maybe, maybe the most, most uh, persuasive is, is the, the NSA uh, leaks, uh, the NSA eavesdropping uh, uh, ev everywhere. Things are really happening out there. We, talk, we see mobile worms that infect devices with NFC capabilities, so NFC, uh, near, near field communication, where you really have a close, very short time interaction with, with the terminal that was considered to be, well, we don't need this, so much security there because the man in the middle attack, which typically we see, how, 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 how easy or how difficult it is to really get into, middle, into the middle of, of such an NFC swipe, if you will. But still, if you install install or have the ability to install a worm inside the device itself, you could redirect. So all these things like malware, ransomware kits, we have read about it. And bottom line is, is can you trust your device? And it is our task in the industry 
to basically provide embedded security that is non-persuasive for the user, that they don't know it's there, but that they can trust. At the end of the day, they want to be able to trust that device, that the payment is gone to the correct party, to the correct amount, and only once. So goals of an attacker, if you will, if you could summarize that, um, competition could be an attacker. Uh, IP can be stolen. That could be uh, IDs, could be patents, could be implementation details. Um, what you see a lot, for example, in Taiwan, where set-top boxes is a big part of their, their market, is there are only, only a handful of chips for set-top boxes. So what is the, the unique selling point of the set-top box maker? It's their software. What do they bring on top of their box? Now, if that's a differentiator, if that, those are the, their USPs, it also means that they want to protect their software. So cloning software basically um, making sure that that's of our basically providing anti-cloning is very important. There, is this, uh, there was this new case that um, this new Chinese uh, handset vendor, Xiaomi, uh, came onto the market actually offering their customers on top of Android, well, if you, if you get our phone, you can get a Samsung look, an HTC look, or an LGE look. And that's definitely not the intention of the guys like Samsung. So other things uh, are uh, goals of attackers like theft of servers. Typically what consumers like to do, they, they like to watch movies for free. Um, user authentication could be an attack goal. Spoofing to be forging user identity. A lot of uh, stories are out there. People basically have their identity stolen and then either IRS or somebody else comes knocking on the door. You owe us some money. Privilege escalation, uh, unlocking features, uh, think automotive where you have the ability to, to build a full-fledged system, then such a car goes to the dealership and the consumer which buys the car determines, well, I don't have the money today for the uh, worldwide navigation system or the European navigation system, I'll only take my own country, and then later on decides, well, maybe I do want to uh, the, the full Western Europe maps, or I do want my entertainment system enabled. If you could just unlock it by a code, that could be very easy. But that uh, feature also could allow people to un start unlocking by themselves. Think of tuning uh, Audi car cars to, to bypass their motor management. That's happening today. Device threat factor. So interception, interruption, modification... Uh, fabrication, creating counterfeit uh, assets, those are all aspects that are happening today. And again, it's our task to help people build systems that maintain and guarantee the revenue stream and avoid uh, that is, this is happening. So what can we do there? What can we do? So, so let's basically in this talk I'm going to focus about two aspects. One is securing the communication which is basically means protecting your data. If you're communi communicating, you want to protect that communication. And the other one is protecting the platform itself, making sure that the platform is either trustworthy, but it also doesn't necessarily mean that you're protecting the assets of the user. Those could be, again, other assets. Now, communication typically is securing end-to-end -end traffic to keep it at its simplest form. Think of VPNs. You're here sitting uh, looking at your iPads or laptops and you have a secure connection to your email server. That's VPN that typically uses a protocol under the hood like IPsec or SSL, which is, uh, which is a well-known, well-established um, uh, protocol. For the other one, the platform security, it's more providing secure storage, uh, uh, protecting the, the execution environment, making sure that you can trust the software that runs on it. Um, so it also needs to ensure that uh, specific key material uh, is protected. Some keys are used by the owner, so no need to protect against hacking those keys. But other keys could be uh, uh, owned by the carrier, could be owned by service provider, could be a license key, if you will. And if you would be able to extract that license key, give it to your neighbor, they could have the same free service. And all these, um, 
all these implementations are uh, basically supported by cryptographic algorithms and their key material. So let's look a bit about cryptography, which is, bottom line at the end of the day, a complex uh, combination of math, uh, computer science, and electrical engineering if you want to, um, if you want to implement it. All, all security and implementation of security um, relies with, on good keys, on having good keys, on the ability to be able to generate good, solid, strong keys. And it all starts with random number generator. And this means really true random number generation, not the ones that do a def slash def slash random call from a, from a C library, which maybe takes a mixture of time and system temperature and hard drive spin, spin up times. No, a real strong random number, which needs to be extracted from hardware. Um, so already we are here at the IP conference. This is where it starts. The minimal implementation you need to have in silicon if you need to generate a key or if you want to do a secure handshake is having a true random number generator on board, which could be an IP core. And then based on the algorithms or based on the protocols you actually need to start supporting, there are dozens of algorithms to choose from. And this is, a, this is a list where you have algorithms. Some, some have already have died, some have, some have gone away, but still, it's, it's not a single algorithm. And it's basically also not an algorithm you should choose, but you, you should let the standardization bodies choose. So for symmetric, um, uh, symmetric uh, encryption, this is basically where you do bulk data because these algorithms allow for very high speed uh, operation. Typically, AES today is the one to choose with a few other variants like Snow and, and Kazumi used by cell phones, just as examples. The other counterpart, the counterpart to symmetric is asymmetric processing, where you can actually have the ability to have two different keys, one for the encryption, one for the decryption, which are totally different, which also gives you the ability to basically mail somebody your public part of that key, just through open channels. No issues there. Bottom line is, why not, why not just do away with the symmetric algorithms where the encrypt and the decrypt keys are identical, just throw them away and just revert. Let's all do asymmetric crypto. Bottom line there is, and the answer is, it's about a million times slower. It needs about double, twice, twice, four times, eight times the real estate in silicon, it needs one and a half million cycles to do one message encryption if you do it in software. Bottom line, extremely slow. So what happens there, we use asymmetric to do key exchanges and to basically encrypt symmetric keys, send those symmetric keys to the other side and then continue to do the build data with symmetric. So for asymmetric, also a couple of algorithms there. And again, the standardization bodies basically pick algorithms, define key lengths to use, how safe are these uh, for the coming years. And based on the duration or the lifetime of your application, you can choose a key size. That's all about crypto. Crypto is hiding. It's making sure the confidentiality part of the data is guaranteed. You also, part of the security protocols, you also need like integrity and authentication. How do you know that a message is actually sent by the person I trust? And how do you guarantee that the message has not been changed in the cause? How do you know there is no man in the middle attack? That's guaranteed by authentication algorithms, which are basically secure and keyed hash algorithms. Robust security uh, uses both symmetric asymmetric and hash cores or hash algorithms to, to make a full-fledged security ecosystem. Now, how, so now, basically, you have chosen an, an, a protocol which basically concludes also which algorithms to support. Maybe you need some legacy, you know the key sizes. Okay, how to implement, how to build it. And obviously, um, uh, the, the middle one is the one you choose. You have always have a CPU on board, so let's do software libraries and let's see where that will get me. And if the performance is right, 
That's typically uh, the way to go. But think about the security, not the crypto part, but the security. Are these algorithms uh, separated from uh, your normal applications? Can applications see the same memory space? Can you basically protect your keys? And if those answers are okay, I have hypervisors, or maybe I have a trust zone implementation, which is the arm way of separating in a normal world and a secure world, you're okay. But the next question is, um, basically, uh, do I have available CPU resources? Um, how about my, my attack model? Uh, typically, software implementations you, you show a bit about their time behavior, about their power behavior. They, they can basically disclose over time some, some values in the bits. So be aware there. And the third one, which is not on the slide, one, one, one definitely, since it needs a lot of more cycles, the power consumption of a software solution typically is also quite significant higher than dedicated hardware. Okay, let's look then at hardware, special purpose silicon. Um, so dedicated special purpose silicon for this task. The pros, high performance, higher security definitely, and it could be expensive at the system level. So what you basically want is IP embedded in your processor. So you could have all the pros of that dedicated special purpose silicon, the high performance, you can offload the CPUs, the lower power, and the disadvantage obviously this this basically needs to be embedded in, in, in an SOC, that SOC needs to be built, uh, that those are lead times and, and basically um, that ta could take a long time, uh, resource intensive, uh, and a lot of tasks, how to do this efficiently. And that, I guess that's where product planning and, and working with a reliable IP vendor comes in, and more on that later. So when you decide to, okay, I will embed security as hardware solutions in my uh, SOC, in my chip, okay, you still have a couple of options there. Develop it internally. Well, that's, that's definitely an option to go. Uh, you can really tailor uh, the implementation to your needs. And, but obviously, on the other hand, it adds, like with all make or buy decisions, it's at risk to your schedule. You need dedicated staffing and dedicated skills there. The, the alternative, as always, is IP licensing. Okay, let's find some crypto cores out there. In the previous slide, I listed all the algorithms. You've noted down, I need AES, I need triple DAS, I need SHA-1 and SHA-2. And I'm, this is my shopping list. I will uh, go for those cores and the actual protocol around it that's, I'll take care of that in my software. So, discrete crypto cores, typically you can even find them in, in opencores.org. These are really easy to find. But, and, and, and I'm happy to talk about that outside, outside this room, it's a really long discussion. It does not necessarily need to be the holy grail. It does not necessarily solve your issues because that protocol around it, still very CPU intensive, and it could really not help that much. If you really look at a lot of protocols where, for example, voice channels are involved, those are really small packets, small data blobs, where the actual key material and the context is, um, uh, which modes to do and how to, how to get there are actually more uh, uh, resource intensive than the actual crypto part itself. So on to the next level, and that's where we at Inside Secure have, uh, have uh, specialized integrated multifunction IP modules. That could be a full-fledged packet engine that can eat layer two ethernet packets and basically without CPU intervention do the whole thing. So what does that help you? It helps you with, with actually f building a, a robust solution with performance scaling, with manageable CPU offload or even full CPU offload, easy, uh, uh, fast time to market. And of, obviously, I like always with IP uh, licensing, is there are some, some, some cons, it's okay, it, it, it will set you back some money, but uh, some calculations may, may be able to... Uh, 
to, to help you out there, that's actually uh, cheaper to, to, to license than to buy yourself. But especially with licensing security IP, you need to trust also that vendor. You need to trust their implementation and that it's conformed to all the standardization bodies, but it's also prone to attack. I have a couple of examples, actually two. Uh, one for that uh, communication security and the other one for platform security. So this is about communication security where you have a, an embedded system that needs to take care. Uh, it has either wireline or wireless uh, interfaces and you need to be able to support one of the, one of the, the, the available uh, security protocols, either at the application layer, which is typically an SSL, TLS, or at the IP layer, where you will be able to do IPsec, or at the uh, Ethernet or uh, network layer, where you typically would do MacSec, or a combination of all of those. So look at a bit of the, the application or the market areas for, so you could have like a, the need to, to build an application processor or mobile application processor or a network processing unit. Depends on which market uh, uh, you're in. Switch ASICs, uh, uh, store and forward ASICs, if you will. Maybe cellular base station chipsets. And we could go on and on and on. Typically, when you have security communication protocol, the needs, typically that, that these are the areas where you are. And uh, we at Inside Secure are happy to advise you which protocols uh, you need. Some Also some application areas, dictated protocols. But here we are again, so SSL, TLS, IPsec, and maybe even MacSec, those you would find in mobile application processors, and the ones that are developed today would already talk about sustaining a one gigabit connection, uh, wireline speed without any performance drop, and still having those CPU cores fully available to do other tasks, not spend all that time on security. In an MPU, typically the use cases for the protocols are more tailored towards one or the other. You could have a cloud server, or you could have basically an IPsec gateway uh, that is basically tailored to do only IPsec. In those situations, you're not talking about one gigabit, you're talking about 10, maybe 40. You're talking about not 10 users, but 10,000, or 1 million, 10 million concurrent users. Think of operator networks that are need to sustain these connections. And going forth on the list, uh, for example, the cellular base station chipsets, those use basically uh, have two connections to, to protect. One are the connections to the actual individual handsets. When you make a phone call, you call to the base station, actually, and that's where you use 2G, 3G, 4G uh, uh, crypto algorithms from the handset. And then to the backbone, to basically the operator network, that's where you have an IPsec connection. Now, depending on the size of the base station, could be 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000 users on the base station. So again, you can imagine quite some power uh, required there. Which brings me to these challenges. How can I basically build, build those protocols and get that performance without burning my silicon, without basically uh, stalling, keeping low latency? Bottom line is that discrete crypto algorithms, so those individual cores you think you have built or have licensed, they cannot do the job. You can, you can build an AES core that runs 10 gigabit per second. Not an issue. But every, again, everything around it, quite challenging. There are enormous amount of memory uh, access is involved, enormous amount of interactions with, uh, with the security stacks. Um, again, in, in many systems you have thousands of tunnels which are the individual connections to manage. Uh, in the protocols, the key actually have a, a given lifetime. That's one of the security experts of the protocol. So you cannot just have static keys and, and run them forever. You actually have to count bytes in the packets and in the payloads and at a certain time, in time, flag that, well, maybe in two seconds I'm going to run out of, the, of my key value. I need to re-establish a key. That's all extra on top of the bare bones crypto. And the one I'd already mentioned in voice, um, these, these, these data objects or these packets, if you will, they are very small. Typically, the payload is less than 64 bytes. 
the key and the initialization vector and all the other things of the protocol, those records are typically like one kilobyte. So one kilobyte of overhead for a 64-byte payload. So that, that actually means managing those things is more important than just encrypting the payload. So we see four times, uh, four methods of increasing performance going forward from the 100 megabit connections that we had a couple of years ago to one gigabit, that's a sweet spot now, but the silicon that's going to be built is for 10 gigabits, 40 gigabits, 100 gigabits of networks. And for that, you need to do a lot of things, not just make more efficient crypto cores. So we have parallelization, making sure that since a single algorithm, and that's the nature of encryption, you just not, cannot say, well, I have one crypto core, I'll just deploy 10, I'll deploy 100. Typically with crypto, that doesn't work because one of the security aspects is that if you have an, a long bit stream, if you flip one bit, that not only that, that following 128 bits in crypto goes wrong, no, everything uh, that follows uh, needs to go wrong. So these, these crypto operations are chained. You need to wait to, until the complete block in, in a block cipher is finished with encryption before you can start the next one and the next one and the next one. So now there are new algorithms defined that you have, can do some parallelism, but you still have the aspects of the protocol that you need to make sure that anti-replay, a packet can only be processed once, a payment should only happen once. So all those checks need to be done. So parallelization can be done with a proper security, synchronization. Think of like similar to, to cache coherency. Um, packet classification, basically when a security packet comes in or IP packet comes in, who determines what to do with it? Typically that's the Ethernet stack or the Wi-Fi network stack, which is a software task. At 10 gigabits and beyond, that's not a software task anymore because it's too complex, too many bit uh, manipulations, and it will be the bottleneck of your system. So packet classification, packet classification could be a function that could be added to that uh, hardware security core. Efficient data movement. Uh, today's SOCs already have memory access times of maybe 500 nan nanoseconds and beyond, and it's going to 800 nanoseconds. And if you have a packet, again, a packet coming in at 64 bytes pace in a 10 gigabit port, you can imagine that you already don't have the time to fetch my key from main memory and, and in order to, 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 uh, to process that packet. So also efficient data movements, efficient caching is very important. And last but not least, there is always a software component. There's always, with the data plane, which is this, there's always a control plane aspect. And to be able to work efficient there, speak the same language, speak, uh, work with the same data structures is key there. And that's why at Insight we don't just help you with the hardware IP, we'll help you and your customers with those software stacks because they are part of the solution. Uh, so we have a product family of security packet engines of which we can, in our small booth, can, uh, can show you a bit more. Those are segmented IP cores with all those uh, optimizations aspects already in there. Again, serving markets where you have application processors, so we'll talk about moderate speeds, to the very high speeds for carrier networks, if you will. And since not every module needs every function, it's not that we have one big piece of IP and you're stuck with a couple of million gates adding to your design. No, it's really what do you need, how much performance do you need, how much CPU resource do you want to save, and that determines the gate count. And that could start already from sub 100k gates up to the, like the 7 to 10 million gates for the full-fledged 100 gig security core. The second example, so leaving the secure communications behind, is trusting the platform. And what that means is asset protection, and an asset could be key material, could be identities, uh, could be licenses, and privilege execution. So what does that mean? Basically, um, we need to provide two things there. We need to secure the platform itself, which means 
you boot trusted software and you allow to do trusted upgrades of that software, uh, you, you separate your applications, even more strict than hypervisors could do. Uh, you provide still provide debug capability, but in a protected way. Uh, you can provide secure timers, basically for time-based licenses, if you will. Um, and I forgot the first one, which is the trust anchor. Basically, what you should see today in chips is you already have a die ID, which is a unique ID. What if you have in non-volatile memory a way of provisioning that with a unique ID, keep it secret, and use that as the trust anchor, the root of trust for all your security operations? And that's what you typically want to see in, 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 in today's modern chips with platform security. Going a, a, a notch higher in security, think smart cards. Physical security is very important. Think tamper-resistant storage for assets, at least for one key for that root of trust. And that could be, uh, could be very important. So the challenges to providing the platform security are uh, threat resistance. Because now I have a key vault, but I, I must be able to use those keys. And typically, if you have a key vault and you have a security application, that software application could say, well, can you give me that key? Because I need it for crypto. That must be then a very secure application because typically we don't want that. So what if we could actually find a way, and we did that, that the application doesn't need to see the key anymore. The application knows there is a key vault. I asked the key vault key generator to generate a key for me. Uh, I was able to export it in a secure way to the other end of the connection. And now I can ask that security, that platform security module to actually do my encryption tasks for me. So the application, which runs uh, the GUI and the high level stuff, maybe it's a file, encrypt application, could actually start asking a security module, please use my key, which in slot is in slot number 12 of the key vault, and use that for file encryption. And the file is over there, please fetch it with your secure DMA uh, engine, do the crypto and write it somewhere else. Application has never seen the key, it is protected. So just, uh, just, uh, just uh, a small example of how a platform security module could actually help out there. So, providing platform security in an IP it be begins with this hardware root of trust, uh, like I said, so it's privileged access to that non-volatile memory. There should only be this security module that accesses, has access to it. So support for secure, bug, so secure debug and secure boot, and, and, and the, the secure generation of keys, storage of keys, and the secure use of keys. Timers for key lifetime, the true random number generator, that actually is the foundation of key generation. And if you do have to do key uh, exchange, for example, talking to an SSL server, you need to actually do key exchanges, like I said in the, in the beginning with that asymmetric schemes, then you need to basically uh, time, okay, do I do this once when I initially boot up the device for the very first time, I maybe generate a key, then you can allow maybe 20 seconds or a minute uh, for that key to be generated. Is that something that needs to be done every time you wake up the device? Then that's not definitely not going to be a software task and you need some accelerator to help you with that public key uh, scheme. There are some uh, imp implementation hurdles. Uh, so you need to protect the critical functions uh, like the software should not directly uh, access, uh, for example, these keys. But bottom line, you still want to maintain performance. Again, so security must be there, but actually the users don't want to know it's there. They want to be able to trust the device, and it shouldn't be like, well, if security is switched on, the device battery life is now only one morning instead of a full day, and the performance is, is bad users will disable it or they will switch to another vendor's device who has solved this correctly. Um, 
I guess this is more repetition. So our secure platform IP, they provide uh, all, these, uh, all these features. Uh, they ensure the platform integrity and they provide these accelerated crypto services. As a summary, so embedded security, it's basically secure communications and or uh, platform security. Embedded security depends on an effective use of cryptography, which is the underlying uh, foundation. Uh, talked about these three ways, uh, software only, uh, discrete chips, well, actually four, uh, discrete cores on chip and actually full-fledged packet engines or platform IP modules to embed in your systems. Um, talk about a bit, uh, talked a bit about the platform security and the threat resistance. Um, basically, what it means is uh, we've been working together with, uh, with a lot of uh, of tier, tier one vendors. Uh, we are around here with small boots, so let's discuss your security needs. We're out there. Uh, my email address is there if you want to reach out to me. Thank you for your time.